Yes, well, we, we did have, this was clarified by FIFA as well, huh? and, and IFAB as well. Spitting is actually a red card offence. This is clearer. We, we understand this. Of course, but in matches, we need to understand that players do this to, to get rid of the flame. They're encouraged to spit away from players because this is, during this pandemic, it has, uh, uh, it's given us new um, responsibilities and new challenges as well, huh? Uh, but uh, spitting at a player, spitting at an opponent is a red card. And we had this change maybe three or four years ago. But of course, we need to accept as well uh, where players are spitting that, uh, you know, obviously spitting is not a new phenomenon. Huh? It happened 20, 30 years ago even. But players do it to get rid of the slim, the phlegm. So they're encouraged to spit on the ground, not towards uh, an opponent, into you know, areas which are uh, not uh, around players because we need to be mindful of this pandemic uh, is spread by you know by breathing by the air by the mouth by the fluids so we need to be careful huh? um but uh, but fifa have definitely come out and and provided guidance on this okay it is to be discouraged if you need to please please spit in a in a uh, area away and obviously Spitting at a player, spitting at a match official is a red card. The VAR Show. The one place for your weekly football update. So hello, a very warm welcome to VAR show, the show which talks about all the base major football leagues in detail. Today we are going to conduct some interviews and we have FIFA F3 assessor and instructor Mr. Hakan Anas with us. So without wasting much time, I would like to first thank Hakan for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show and I would like to begin by asking you, how are you and what are you doing these days? Uh, these days it's busy, huh? Um... I'm also one of the AFC referee, uh, AFC Academy referee instructors. So, because of this uh, coronavirus, it's uh, this pandemic that has hit all around the world. Um, many of our, uh, of our our activities have now changed. So we have a lot of uh, online courses. So I've been doing uh, uh, a lot of the modules for the uh, referee academy online. Uh, on top of this, we have FIFA. Also, the FIFA uh, uh, the courses need to go on. So the member association courses, many of the leagues are starting and they need constant education. So we have this as well. So we have uh, big responsibilities for this. Also, uh, I'm also an assessor in Australia. Um, and we just finished our league maybe two or three weeks ago. So this was also a busy period. And on top of this, we have AFC. At the moment, I am in um, in Doha from uh, in Qatar. We're trying to finish the um, uh, Asian Champions League, so in the West region. So uh, because of the the coronavirus, this was uh, obviously impacted. No travel. Uh, many countries closed their borders. So we have now met in Doha to try and finish the 2020 uh, Asian Champions League. Um, and so we're at. Today, uh, Thursday, will be the third match day. So all is going well, all is busy. Um, and as an instructor, as an assessor, we always work to do. So um, I'm happy to be able to join you for a little while and uh, be able to answer any of your questions. Of course, and you know, like, uh, I, th I th thank you once again, you like, for taking time on your match day and coming. I wanted to ask you, like, you know, like, the this pandemic was never foreseen and it was like, shocking for everyone and you're like and you are with the afc right now how difficult was it you know like for you to get back to fitness out of so much time when you did not know no one practically knew what was going to happen so how did you get back into fitness for being in contention for the competition well i can speak for afc so afc have continued with a lot of the um the the fitness requirements technical requirements of their referees so just to give you a bit of history, um, we have uh, referee technical educators who work with all of our elite AFC elite referees. So they gave them technical advice, but we also have fitness as well. 
And um, so from an AFC point of view, our referees are still uh, doing the fitness. Um, anecdotally, I've also spoken to many a AFC referees. Um, because of this pandemic, because uh, people can't go to work, they're at home, they're in lockdown, Many are saying actually, and they're only allowed one, two, three hours of exercise per day. Many are saying that there's probably the fittest I've ever been for a long time. So maybe an advantage for this pandemic, it gives referees the ability to stay at home, not go to work and improve their fitness. But it has been difficult, I have to admit, because also, I mean, I come from a, from a country like Australia. It's, um, if we look at, um, uh, um, the facilities in Australia, we have a lot of um, athletics fields, we have a lot of parks, we have a lot of um, you know, football fields. So this is, hap this is easy for us, but I understand in a lot of Asian countries, the facilities are not there, so it's, it is difficult. But um, from what we see, uh, we, for this Champions League, uh, this um, uh, in Doha, the, I won't call it the championships, but it's actually the, the Champions League. Our referee fitnesses has actually been quite good. We had a, um, uh, a referee a fitness check uh, for the referees and the assistant referees um, maybe three or four days ago, and all of them passed. It was really good, really, really good to see. So the referees are fit. Um, of course, we also have fitness, but we also have match fitness as well. You know, positioning, reading the game, this, this. So we found that the, the, the leagues that have continued or started maybe two or three months ago, like the Koreans, their fitnesses and their reading of the game is a lot better. Whereas some, uh, in some countries where the, the leagues has been dormant for the last six months, the referees are fit, but um, reading the game is, is, you can see there's still a little bit more, uh, little bit more time to, to, to accept. But uh, we're generally happy with this. So, but uh, like I said, there's many, many courses that we've been running. I know for the Referee Academy, every, every uh, online module that we have, we have uh, two hours of um, online technical training and one hour of fitness. And uh, we have specialist fitness uh, educators um, in AFC who are also FIFA World Class um, FIFA instructors, fitness instructors, and they, they take them through um, fitness uh, uh, fitness exercises. So uh, again, we don't have any problem with uh, with our fitness, um, but again, it is uh, it is testing as well, huh? We we need to understand this. Of course, anyway, like I want to ask you, like refereeing is a very difficult job because all of, you have to have the fitness and also the uh, uh, mentally you have to be very aware throughout the game. And I want to ask you, like, how has that how has the dynamics changed, you know, like because of the pandemic, because now you may have to keep into mind more of the subtle uh, factors like maybe spitting or something which uh, which would which would not be have been considered before the pandemic. Is that changed something? Yes, well, we, we did have, this was clarified by FIFA as well, huh? and, and IFAB as well. Spitting is actually a red card offence. This is clearer. We, we understand this, of course, but in matches, we need to understand that players do this to, to get rid of the flame. They're encouraged to spit away from players because this is during this pandemic, it has, uh, uh, it's given us new um, responsibilities and new challenges as well. Huh? Uh, but uh, spitting at a player, spitting at an opponent is a red card. And we had this change maybe three or four years ago. But of course we need to accept as well uh, where players are spitting that, uh, you know, obviously spitting is not a new phenomenon. Huh? It happened 20, 30 years ago even, but players do it to get rid of the slim, the phlegm. So they're encouraged to spit on the ground, not towards uh, an opponent into you know, areas which are uh, not uh, around players because we need to be mindful of huh? this pandemic uh, is spread by, you know, by breathing by the air by the mouth by the fluids so we need to be careful huh? um but uh, but fifa have definitely come out and and provided guidance on this okay it is to be discouraged if you need to please please spit in a in a uh, area away and obviously spitting at a player spitting at a match official is a red card 
of course and you like uh, I- i'll go more personal and you know, like um, you have been an accountant for such a long time why refereeing like how did you want did you always want to be a referee okay so um i was always a pl- i was always a player i started playing when i was 7 years old and uh, i loved playing uh, i actually played in the first division in uh, in victoria so i went all the way up to first division and i was i started at the age of 7 I loved football. I loved everything. I loved watching it. I remember the times when my father used to. Uh, we used to watch the Saturday night uh, EPL. I used to just love it. Just love watching football. I could watch football, you know, ten uh, hours, twelve hours a day, easy. I, I love it, and I love playing it. And uh, I was always uh, always playing it at school, and I played for at um, at uh, at club level, and obviously in the first division. But uh, I got to the age when I was like 22, 23, and uh, I have a philosophy: if you do something, do something to the best that you can. And uh, for me, I wanted to make uh, more or less, uh, you know, national level and international level. And then I realised, okay, I can play football; there's no problems. But uh, I, I want to make the topper. And my age. I was uh, obviously 23, 24. I thought to myself, look, no club is going to sign a 25, 26 year old. By the time you you develop, you get into the system, and I was realistic about this, huh? And uh, I decided uh, playing. I finished. This is it. I don't. I, I don't want to do this. But I love football. I, I love football, and I decided, okay, well, what what do you want to do? You want to be involved in football? I had two options. I had either um, uh, become a referee or become a coach. And luckily, I had uh, two friends who were uh, a coach and a referee. One was a coach, and he used to say to me, "Hakan, when you become a coach and you start off at juniors, you're basically a bus driver. Huh? You pick the kids up, you drop them off, you have the game. It's it's like a bus driver, you know." And he told me it's very stressful. Huh? It's 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 very uh, Time-consuming, and my other friend who was a referee, uh, I'd known him since high school, and he used to say to me, "Oh, it's good money. You go, you do your game, and you know you don't you don't have much time. It's good good pocket money." And I thought, "Yeah, it's good pocket money. I'll go. I'll do it. I'll do a game or two on the weekends. Fantastic." So I I enrolled as a referee, thinking it won't take up much of my time. Little did I know now. I'm more busy now than what I was before. You know, I got into it. I enjoyed refereeing, and I thought after about uh, six months, nine months, I thought to myself, you know, I, I really enjoy this. I really, really enjoy this. I need to take this more seriously. Huh? So I looked at how ha- I looked at my fitness. I looked at the uh, laws of the game. I was very eager, and I had this passion. I had this uh, drive inside me to say, okay, you need again the same philosophy. If you want to do this. Do do something and do it to the best of your ability. And uh, after a short time, after like two years, I was uh, recruited into the, uh, the Victorian Premier League, which was the highest league in Victoria in Melbourne. And when I received this appointment, it was unheard of. I was a grade three. We in Australia we had grade one, which is the highest. Grade two, second, and grade three was the lowest. And a grade three doing Premier League was almost unheard of. Almost unheard of, and I know many of the other referees were saying hey, this is not possible, you know. But uh, again, I, I said I am going to take this opportunity. I took this opportunity. I worked hard, and for the first year, I said to myself, "Look, I want to just complete this first year without any controversy. Next year, I'll worry about setting new goals." And luckily, uh, I did well. First year was good. So then, second year again, I kept on going on, and I reset my um, my my goals, and then I said, "Look, I, I want to be FIFA. I want to be a, a FIFA re- referee or an assistant referee." So slowly, slowly, the 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 goals changed, the the initiatives, the, everything that I was working toward, the drive, um, and. Uh, This was in uh, 2001. I was nominated for a FIFA badge. I ended up getting it in 2005 because of uh, things out of my control. So once I became a FIFA assistant referee, um, I, I reset my goals and I said I want to be an elite 
referee. So I want to be at, on the Asian, uh, in the Asian panel. So this was a new goal for me. Once I did this, then I set a new goal of, um, of uh, I want to go to the World Cup. And this is this is a thing that we had. So we we uh, or our group, our referees were uh, World Cup referee candidates in 2012, and we were honoured enough, um, humbled enough to to go to Brazil 2014 and represent Australia. Um, and having said that, after uh, 2014, I retired from my job. I I was an accountant with uh, the tax office, so I I have a masters in in tax. I decided uh, after the World Cup, my passion was refereeing. My, my, I loved refereeing, I loved football. And even though it was a big, big, big pay cut, uh, I decided I, I want to retire from my job as an accountant. I said to my boss, I'm leaving. And he was really shocked because, you know, my he was thinking my responsibility after the World Cup, I would have more time to, don't, to, um, to have with my job as an accountant so he was thinking of more plans for me, but I said, no, I go where my passion is. My passion was refereeing. I resigned from the tax office in 2015. And in 2015, I uh, attended the FIFA Futura course where I come first in Asia. Um, and then Asia AFC said, I can't come work with us. And I said, yes, absolutely. And everything else has been really, uh, it's been a journey. It's been a passion, but it's also been about hard work. Huh? Hard work and also learning from um, many, many of my educators. I had, uh, I was lucky enough to have learnt from the best educators in refereeing. And um, for example, I had uh, uh, Farhad uh, Abdullayev from Uzbekistan, who was like my mentor. I also had uh, Ali Traivi, who was my mentor. Uh, with the Referee Academy, I had um, Fernando Tresaco from Spain, who gave me an, an understanding football for, at a different level from these experts and uh, Subkidin from, um, uh, from Malaysia all helped me. And uh, slowly, slowly we went on this journey. So at the moment, I'm, I'm one of the AFC experts. So um, we do a lot of analysis, we do a lot of work. My role here in Doha at the moment is one of the uh, technical instructors and also one of the VAR instructors. So we had a course yesterday, even though it was our day off, we need to prepare the referee. So this is, we need to understand this. This is a lot of work huh? and we need to instruct, we need to teach, we need to clarify. So when the games start in, for the VAR in the Champions League in, in, uh, in, in the quarterfinals and semifinals, our referees are 100% ready. So we went through the simulator. We went through uh, two, two and a half hours of training. Um, many questions, many queries. So this was this was a good experience. But um, I'm fortunate enough to have this uh, many, many great mentors, many, many great educators. Um, also our director, who at AFC, who has been an absolute support for us, uh, Shamsul Mandin. Uh, we also had AFC. Um, my good uh, mentor as well, uh, Mr. Hani from uh, Qatar, also Deputy Chairman of the FIFA Referees Committee. Um, we have uh, a good relationship with him and we, we speak with him and he supports us all, all the time. So this is, this is very, very important for, for referee development, referee education. So um, this, this is where we're at at the moment. Of course, I wanted to ask you, like you know, like you have been like in the in the, in the whenever you uh, when you have been involved with uh, refereeing and uh, officiating games in in the past, I think ten years there has been a lot of changes in terms of maybe technology coming in in various aspects, maybe like uh, goal line or maybe now VAR, which you're involved in. Is it like uh, what do you what is your opinion of the full te uh, uh, technology coming into football? Is it necessary according to you? Oh look, if we look at the way. Look, um, if we look at the last 10, 15 years up, I remember maybe maybe uh, it would have been 2006, maybe mid 2000s when uh, assistant referees never even had beat flags, you know, beat flags and communication. And this was all new to us. This is wow, you know, and 
And if we look at this, so we had beat flags, we had communications, then we moved on to goal line technology, which we used in Brazil. And then after that, uh, 2015, FIFA decided we want to have the video assistant referee system. Look, uh, football, okay, football is about human interaction and, and whatnot. And, and we always accept that there will be some errors, some problems, but if we can use technology for the benefit of refereeing for the football, why not? Goal line technology example. Sometimes the re assistant referee cannot see the ball crossing over the goal line. This is an important situation. This is, imagine I'm the team, I need to win to go to the next round. I score a goal, but the assistant referee cannot see. Goal line technology gives me this fairness. It gives me this fairness. So then goal line technology, it says it's a goal. I win one nil. This is good for football. It's good for the image. It's good for the participants. So this was the start. Now we're going to look at VAR. This is also good. We, we know VAR is involved in four big incidents. Red card, penalty, goal or no goal, or mistaken identity. These are situations which, you know, can change the uh, the the outcome of a match. Huh? Penalty, goal, red card. This these are all situations, yeah. And we need to make sure it's correct because sometimes we see, and it's impossible. We look at how football has evolved over the last, uh, you know, 20, 30 years. It's gone more faster. It's gone more technical. Referees impossible. Even though the referees, from a technical, from a fitness level, are more fit than they've ever been. It's impossible to see every situation, you know, handball. You can't see it. Sometimes it's, you know, you, you miss no matter how fit you are because there's a, a player in front of you or it's on your blind side. Why cannot we use uh, the video assistant referee or technology to correct this? Football expects this. Football is about two teams playing football and the referee shouldn't play a part in deciding the outcome of a match. So FIFA and I have come in and said, we, we, will, uh, we will start this video assistant referee. And I think if we look from where we came, where we started from in 2015 to now, there has been some big, big, uh, big, big uh, developments. It's been for the better of, uh, of, of refereeing. Of course, we always have with new technology, with new situations, teething issues, yes. But I think, I, I believe that this is the way forward. FIFA have said this, I've ever said it, and I think uh, the referees also accept, and we talk about the video assistant referee being like a parachuter, it's a parachute. It saves the referee. Huh? The referee doesn't want, doesn't want to have any controversy, doesn't want to miss a penalty, or a goal being scored, or a red card. He doesn't want this. This is the last thing. I can tell you this as a referee, if I missed an offside situation, a goal was scored from offside as an assistant, and and I made an incorrect decision, I would feel very bad. I did feel bad. I, it happened to me. But now the video assistant referee helps us to correct this. This is good. This is a parachute for the on-field officials. So I, I fully believe that the path that we are on is correct. Football expects this. Uh, the spectators expect this, the, the, the players, the, the, uh, the team officials, this is all good, huh? This is all good. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree. Of course, and you know, like from there, I'll move to another aspect, you know, like uh, many footballing referees, you know, have called for, you know, better protection of referees who are officiating games. Personally, have you ever feared while refereeing a game or did you ever receive any threats before or after the game? Oh, look, uh, my character is very strong huh? and, and being a referee, you need to be stronger. Huh? You need to be thick skinned. Huh? And uh, there have been some, sometimes I remember one uh, uh, Asian Cup qualifier uh, would have been in 2011, I think it was. Um, the referee gave a 100% correct decision against the home team. It was 100% correct, but the home team did not like it. But uh, we as referees are stronger and uh, we, we are need to be thick skinned. Huh? So we don't bend for anything. We need to do this, to do this occupation, to do this job. 
you need to have a strong character. Huh? It's not for the not for the week because you have 22 players, you have team officials, you have maybe 20, 30,000 spectators. Huh? But you need to do a job, huh? and you need to do it fair, fairly. Huh? So um, being affected, never. Uh, I, I don't think so. It can, it can obviously when you see these sorts of things. Um, just, just to give you a bit of context, you know. What happened to us in this game in 2011 was a lot of water bottles being thrown onto us. But uh, we went out in the second half and did a, a, a even more uh, tougher job, a more correct job. Uh, this brings out your character as well, huh? um, because there are going to be, unfortunately, refereeing is about uh, it's about opinions, huh? and uh, we see, of course, when you give a 100% penalty against one team, the other team's going to be upset. But we're not here to be popular. Huh? We're, be, we're here to be fair. Huh? And this is what a referee is to be. So um, I can say this uh, from, um, from a personal point of view. I've never been swayed by this. I never will be swayed by this. If I was ever swayed by outside pressure, um, I said this as even as a referee, I would give up. I, I would not do this. My integrity, my honesty is never up for sale. Huh? So um you can say anything you want you can do anything you want you will not affect me and i know 99.9% .9 of referees have this same mentality they realize yes uh, this is the way and uh, to be a referee is a, is a tough job but it's an honest job as well huh Officer, I wanted to ask you one thing you know, I, when i've spoken in whatever limited capacity to different referees all over the world and uh, I've spoken to uh, other referee uh, instructors and uh, coaches, and they have said like you know like many a times they notice that you know like many referees whom they are dealing with do not have a clear understanding of the maybe the laws of the game. And you also you have been the assessor and you have been instructor. Do you find similar like where you see referees who do not have clear understanding of the laws of the game? Okay, so talking about the laws of the game, we have a very extensive uh, education um, activities at AFC level, even a lot of uh, member associations, but also at FIFA level as well. I've discussed this before as well, where we take uh, referees through the laws of the game, the changes, we give in-depth in discussion, we look at clips. This is no different to the ACL though. Uh, so the Asian Champions League here, we had uh, three or four days preparatory course. So we went through things like penalty area incidents, handball, tactical fouls, challenges, offside, positioning and movement, everything we looked at to make sure our referees are on the same page. Yeah? Um, you know, laws of the game, we, AFC have uh, invested and FIFA have invested huge amounts into ensuring that the technical abilities of referees are very, very high uh, at the highest level. Huh? Uh, AFC, my role as uh, as uh, as a uh, AFC referee academy instructor as well, just to give you some context, we have online activities. So every three weeks we have a laws of the game test. So we will test them about their knowledge of the laws of the game. We have a video test. So one is looking at the laws of the game, but two is also practical as well. And we also have discussion clips as well. So slowly, slowly, if we look at how we, where we came from 20 years ago to now at FIFA AFC level, and a lot of member association as well are following this same concept, uh, especially at elite level, at uh, FIFA level, uh, the laws of the game, the knowledge of the referees are very good. Okay, maybe sometimes they may misinterpret. This is what my role is there. And this is what we've been doing when, when we had the preparatory course. They ask questions, sir, can we ask about this? And we clarify. Huh? So we're all on the same page. Actually, having said this, we, we will also have uh, uh, some, some new clarifications from uh, FIFA coming out soon, just to give you a, a, a taste. So I'm sure uh, this will be advertised as well. But we make sure that all referees understand the current thinking at AFC, at FIFA level. So problems on the field, we don't have her. Huh? But uh, of course, this is like a, this is like a school. Huh? This is this is very much like a school. You, if you look at uh, when I was in school, we had uh, you know for example mathematics class. We had the smart guys 
who knew everything and some guys who was not as smarter. So our role as an educator is to bring these ones who are not up, you know, is, is not at the level that we need to bring them up to a higher level. Huh? But this is no different in refereeing as well. Yes, some don't open the laws of the game book, you know, especially at the lower levels, at the junior levels and maybe, you know, at uh, amateur level. Our role as educators is to try and teach them this. Huh? So you look at, uh, for example, which I, I, I realise uh, that just recently, maybe two or three months ago in India, they had a laws of the game competition. Oh, I think uh, I remember seeing this online. Huh? So we had many referees involved and, you know, answering quizzes and for like a competition. This is a good thing. Huh? This is good. So I think uh, the technical abilities around, around the world are improving. Um, laws of the game. I always said uh, as, a, as a referee, you need to know the laws of the game. Application out on the field comes with experience. So we know, ah, this is a penalty. But we know holding, pulling, pushing, you know, any type of uh, foul inside the penalty area with contact is a penalty. But we need to know the, 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 the have the experience, the, the, uh, the application of these to say, okay, in this situation, this is a penalty. If in, in some situations, body to body, normal contact, this comes with experience. Huh? So, yeah. Of course, I, mean, like, I wanted to ask you, you know, like, uh, I have no knowledge about the, about uh, being a referee and you have been so experienced. So, you suppose tomorrow onwards, if I plan to become a referee, suppose I plan that in long term, I want to be a referee. So, what are the, like, uh, fitness level that I have to attain, like, according to you? Okay, I can tell you this from now. I, I can, when you start, okay, so I'll, I'll give you some, I'll give you some uh, history. Uh, when I, when I started, um, after I, so I was 20, 22, 23 when I left um, playing and then about 24, 25, I started my license. So I had a one or two years breaker because I was not active. I, I, I gained a little bit of weight. I was just recently married and uh, my wife always feeding me food and, you know, put on the weight. So when I started refereeing, I, like I said, I thought oh, I'll go, you know, one hour, two hours a week. I'd, I will do a game at the weekend and get money. This is fantastic. But then when I started, I realized I like this. Huh? I really, really enjoy this. The passion came back. So I watched, you know, you slowly, slowly set yourself a goal. Huh? You don't want to be, a, you can't run a marathon uh, in, in one month. Huh? Train for one month and then do a marathon. It's just slow incremental steps. So when, we, when I started refereeing, I was not always at the front. You know, I was more or less in the middle. Huh? I was average level of fitness, but I realized if I wanted to go far in this sport, I need to improve my fitness. Huh? So slowly, slowly, I watched what I ate. I lost weight. I become more fit. Instead of training one time a week, I train four or five nights a week. You know, this, these are the sorts of things you need to do if you want to become successful. In the end, I remember one uh, fellow referee who told me when I first started, you get out of refereeing what you put in. If you train four or five nights a week, you will get the benefit. If you train one night a week, don't expect to go to the World Cup. Don't expect to be a FIFA referee because all these, all the requirements at that level is, is very, very high. It depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a junior referee, by all means. You want to go to the highest level, again, you, you, you need to put in the effort, both physically and tech, uh, technically, so you need to understand the laws of the game, have a good appreciation, reading the game, all of this, but also look after yourself. Huh? Because I can tell you a story. Um, we, uh, when we were preparing for Brazil 2014, and I don't know if you ever heard this, but uh, one of the groups, one of the referees was not prepared physically. Huh? He failed the fitness test by 0.01 of a second, not 0.1, 0.01 so the the sprint time had to be under 5.81 uh 5.8 we got 5.81 this was his world cup this is maybe five centimeters 10 centimeters but he was out he was not prepared so at that level the the physical uh, requirements of, are quite high but again for yourself when you start out, don't expect to be running marathons. Get into it, 
Start one night, two nights a week training. See if you enjoy. If you enjoy, if you like, if you have a passion for it, if you're still young, uh, continue and then maybe increase uh, your, your physical, watch what you eat, diet. As referees, we cannot we cannot eat all, always what we want. Huh? We need to say no. We need to make sacrifices because huh? we need to be more fit than the players. The players can stop. The players can substitute. The referee cannot substitute. So players finish after 70 minutes. I'm finished. That's it. I've had enough. I can't go on anymore. I'm injured. But the referee cannot say this. Referee has to go for 90 minutes, sometimes 120 minutes. You need to be physically prepared. To be prepared for this, you need to watch your diet. This is about sacrifice. Again, it's depending on what you want to do. I don't know. How old are you? Uh, how old I'm 25. are you? 25. Okay, so a FIFA referees, uh, the unwritten law, it, there is no age limit, but in my time it was 45, but it can go higher now. There's no age limit. But uh, for AFC, it's 35 to become an AFC elite referee. We have this uh, age limit. So, um, you know, you have 10 years. Uh, now, this is maybe is, is, is acceptable. So you start off at the bottom, you do juniors, slowly, slowly. Depends on, on your ability. I mean, I've, I've seen some referees go from zero to, to the World Cup within 10 years. Really. You know, my good friend, um, Nesta Patana, you know, he, he achieved this. He did it in a really quick time when he went from starting refereeing to making the, the World Cup in Brazil, this was a phenomenal amount of time, you know? Again, some guys have, have the ability and they have the passion and they have the commitment. Maybe, maybe you can achieve this. This is, this is all in your hand though, sure. Of course, I wanted to ask you one thing. What, what did you clock in in that test 5.81 which your other referee had got? Ah, this is a long story, huh? This is... I'll tell you, uh, I was, uh, I remember this, this was a, uh, an interesting situation where we started in 2012 huh? and uh, the official time for this run was uh, under six seconds. If you look at the, it was a 40 meter sprint, huh? so we had to get under six seconds. Huh? So yes, I, during all the, the trials and the, when we, we come for uh, candidate seminars, I was getting underneath the six seconds, but this was not enough. Huh? And I realized, okay, I need to, I need to, I need to improve my times. Huh? Cause I know FIFA was going to bring it down to 5.8. They always said, look, you need to, all, all referees need to improve. Huh? So one of the things I did, I had two years to work on this. Huh? And at the time in 2012, I was 43 years old. By the time I went to the World Cup, I would have been 45. Huh? So I, I realized, okay, well, what do I need to do? I need to take this seriously. So what I did is I employed a run coach to teach me not how to run uh, harder, but how to run smarter, work on my technique. So he gave me, and I would work with him every week, you know, um, technique, because my technique before 2012 was I was fit. I never failed a fitness test, never failed a fitness but I needed to go to another level. So he would work with me. And it was funny because the run coach at the time said to me, you know, Hakan, it is physically, physically known that every year you lose 1% speed. So as you get older, you get slower. This is physically is just a known factor. So it was very hard for me, huh? But I worked, I worked, I worked, I worked on my technique. I made sure I was fit. I made sure I worked smarter. Uh, my run time is very, very consistent. It was 5.61, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65. .5, .5, .5. These were my six runs. So I had a good enough buffer to get under the uh, 5.8. If I hadn't done this, if I hadn't, um, if I hadn't uh, uh, employed a run coach, I'm sure I would have been getting 5.81s, 5.82s. I would have been out of the World Cup. And uh, thank God, I, I really do. I, I, I thank all my coaches, all my educators for giving me 
their time, their effort that enabled me to meet the standard required at FIFA leveler because I only had one chance. 2014 was my first one and only chance to make a World Cup. If I didn't make it then, my age, I would have been finished. I knew this and I retired straight after the World Cup because that was my time. My goal was to make a World Cup. I made the World Cup, I had nothing else to achieve. So then I thought, okay, this is done. What do I need to do? I have an obligation. We all have an obligation to football, to football refereeing. I had 20 years as a referee. I have an obligation to teach the new group. And this is what I, I love about the Referee Academy. I want to see one of my students go to the World Cup. If they can go to the World Cup, then I have achieved my goal. If I don't, then I will be very disappointed. But I have, I can tell you, in batch 2018, I have some fantastic referees, really, really. They are ready now to become elite. And they have this, um, this mongrel. It's, it's like if they come second, they get upset. And I, I sometimes see it. It's ve they're very, very competitive. And I can see this is what you need. This is the difference between a good referee and an excellent referee. Someone who doesn't accept second. You get, he gets 90% uh, in, in the laws of the game test and he, you can see how angry he is. He, says, oh, I, oh. he gets very angry because he wants excellence. He doesn't want just good. You know, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the situation. So, you know, the fitness for me, you know, again, that, this was a reality for me. Good it was not acceptable for World Cup. Excellent was. And for me to do this, I needed to change the way I run. I was old. You know, 43, 40, at, at the time, 43, 44. I needed to change this, but only I can change this. No one else can change this. I need to change this. So it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of time away from the family. I know I used to start, I had a full-time job working in the, in the tax office. I would wake up at 5.30 in the morning, go to work, come back, straight to training, come back seven, eight o'clock, maybe some online activities. By nine o'clock, I was gone. I hardly, you know, very rarely see my family. These are the sacrifices we make. These are the sacrifices we make. And fitness is one of those sacrifices we need to make. Huh? Diet, time away from home. This even being here is time away from home. Huh? But uh, we, have a, we have a passion for refereeing. Huh? Officer, I wanted to catch on one point, you know, like, like you mentioned, like, you know, like how you have uh, referees who you know, when they score 90% and they, in the laws of the game and they are disappointed, which is rightly so, they are aiming for excellence and everyone should. I, I wanted to ask you, like, in your time, like, where you are instructing referees or, or, or mentoring them, what is the law in the law of the games in which they make mistakes the most? Oh, look, uh, some, well, it's... Uh... It just depends, huh? Like law three, number of players, some, some of the referees don't understand. But this is, again, this is my role, huh? My role and our roles as educators to teach them. And so what we do is, the, and this is the, the philosophy, we don't just give them the answer, we explain, huh? And then, so for example, in the Referee Academy, we had some problems with some of the questions. So we we explain, we we. Uh, advise we we cover in our online modules and we tell them okay this is the situation this is what this law means huh? and then when we test later on we find that now they understand this is this is again this is acceptable it's like a, it's it's like being a tutor huh? you know your maths tutor you have some kid some uh, student who's only getting 50 or 60 percent others are getting 90 percent but those ones who are getting 50, 60%, what do they do? They hire a tutor to improve their level, their understanding, to get to that level that they need to get to, you know, 100% or 90% or 95%. This is my role as well. Huh? Um, but uh, the laws of the game, I mean, we have the main laws, offside, uh, law 11, uh, fouls and misconduct, law 12 is probably the biggest, law 5, um, duties of the referee uh, number of players law three also is, is difficult huh? you know also penalty kick we have changes to the amendments to the laws of the game so we make sure that they understand this you know to say it's it's 
one or the other. I mean, probably if you look at law one, law two is probably the, some of the shortest and probably some of the easiest huh, um, to understand. But, uh, you know, you can't say this is the only one because you can see, especially when there is a change to the laws of the game, um, some of the referees don't understand, they haven't been advised, but once, once we tell them, we tend to find that the, the level of understanding has improved. Huh? Yeah. Of course, anyway, like I'll, I'll move on from that. I wanted to ask you, like you have been involved in in games, both at club level and also the national level, also the, with the World Cup, which is the highest stage of football. Which one do you particularly think or enjoyed the most? Oh, without a, without a doubt, I'd say this uh, was uh, 2014 World Cup, uh, the round of 16. Um, this is uh, Costa Rica versus Greece. Huh? Um, you know, this is uh, this was the highlight for us because as Australian referees, this was the first time a trio of Australian referees went past the group stage. Huh? We honestly, uh, you know, we 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 had zero expectation. We we expected when we went to the World Cup in Brazil, we would get one game. We ended up getting three games, and this uh, round of sixteen was the the pinnacle, was the the highlight for us. It was groundbreaking for Australian referees. First time um, Australian trios went past the, the group stage and uh, we had a good performance. Uh, we were happy with uh, uh, our performances on the field. Um, and, you know, Greece lost, Costa Rica won on penalties. And after the game, the Greece captain come up to us and he said, look, we lost on the field. We have no complaints about the referees. You did your job. And that was his last game as the as the captain of Greece, and uh, to to get this type of appreciation from the losing team, you know, when we turned back from the tournament and went home, we could hold our heads up, heads up high to say, you know what, we represented our country to the best, we achieved uh, extraordinary, but it came with the the, the worker. This was this was uh, this was. For me, it was the pinnacle, but also uh, the London Olympics as well. We were there. London Olympics was a fantastic uh, uh, experience. We had the, the, the privilege of refereeing on, in Old Trafford, um, Manchester United's ground, you know, the, the atmosphere, the culture. Um, walking out on, onto that field, it was just something you, you, you dream about, you know. Um, so it was fantastic feeling. And then for me to have my last game um, as a referee, competitive game at the World Cup, and to say adios. Um, after that, I, I spoke to the, the referees, I spoke to my director, and I said, you know, I've achieved a lot. It's now time for the younger guys to come up. Huh? I can keep on going. It's, it's not about me. It never has been about me. It's about, you know, um, it's about the, for the good of the game, uh, as FIFA used to say. Um, and uh, I realised it was my time. So I said, now I pass the baton on to the young guys. Yes, uh, as Australian referees, as Australian assistant referees, you know, the goal now is not past the, um, the, 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 the group stages to try and do a World Cup final. Uh, this, is the, this is the goal. Huh? If we are technically prepared and, and we have the passion and we do, and, and, and uh, our Education is 100%. Why, why, why not? You know, I've done a round of 16. Why can't I do a quarter final or a semi final or third or fourth playoff or uh, a final? These are goals that we need to strive to. And you won't, if you don't believe in yourself, you'll never get it done. Okay? Hmm. Of course, Anil, like, uh, we are coming to the end, and I have three more questions to ask you. And the first of the third is, you know, in the present scenario, this might put you in a little bit of a difficult spot. If you had to choose your top five referees who are working all around the world, who would they be? Oh, the top five referees. Uh, geez, um, having uh, worked with, uh, having spoken to Pierre Luigi Kalina, this is a guy who I have uh, the utmost respect. Uh, and this is a guy who has uh, changed the refereeing. Uh, um, my current director at um, 
at uh, FIFA is Bissaka as well. He was a fantastic referee, went to two World Cups. He's uh, the training, the education that he has. Um, you know, there are many, many fantastic referees. I, I used to enjoy um, uh, the Mexican is also, the Mexican also have uh, a very good refereeing pedigree. Huh? Um, I liked uh, Fabrizio Arturo Carter, I think it was, Fabrizio from uh, Mexico. He had a fantastic body language and his running and his decision making. And, you know, I really, really enjoyed uh, watching him as a referee. Um, my referee was also a pleasure to work with, but that was because of he, he, he put in, I could see the, the hard work that he had. So Ben Williams was a fantastic referee as well. Um, from Asia, also, you, you need to look at uh, a guy like Ravshan, Ravshan Irmatova, was a fantastic referee. You know, just recently retired and now is a uh, deputy minister of sport in his country. But uh, his personality, his character, um, his uh, achievements on the field, who can say that they've been to three World Cups, than the most uh, World Cups, uh, World Cup games in history. Um, so he is another one. Um, you know, there are so, so many, uh, but the ones that come to my mind are those ones are um, fantastic referees, fantastic people, really humble. And uh, to see them out on the field was just, uh, was just awesome. Huh? Yeah. Of course, and you know, like, uh, I'll ask you two more. And uh, the uh, second last question is like, uh, you know, like, you've had quite a successful career in terms of refereeing. Like you have managed every way and whatever goals you set out, you kind of achieved by going to the World Cup and Olympics and everything. But if you had to choose one standout moment from your career, which one would that be? My one standout, uh, when you talk about uh, as a memory, as a memory yeah. or like refereeing or yeah. uh, well, Actually, one thing that really stood in my mind was uh, when I was uh, at Brazil and uh, we were in the, in the seminar room. This is a, a very, very, uh, very, very in-depth feeling for me. And I looked around the room and there was Howard Webb and there was uh, Rizzoli from, um, from uh, Italy and Irmatov and uh, from Japan was uh, Yuichi and all these top class referees. And when I stood there and I looked around and I said, you know what? I deserve, we deserve to be here because we worked hard. You know, Shakir from, uh, from Turkey who has done two semifinals, World Cup semifinals. I looked around the room and I said, look at these World Cup referees, huh? Yes, the best referees in the world. But we deserve to be here because we worked there. This was a fond memory from not uh, officiating wise, so on the field, but off. This was a very, very, this was, this was a fond memory. And the second, well, the one that was tied to this as well was um, the announcement of getting the World Cup, huh? getting to the World Cup. Because I remember I was with uh, my referee, Benjamin, and the other assistant was uh, Matthew Cream. And we had a game, I think it was on a Wednesday or a Tuesday. And the next day, FIFA Referees Committee were meeting in Zurich to decide, you know, the, the, the referees who would be chosen to go to Brazil. And um, they said to me, Hakan, you know, I was confident. I thought, you know, we'd done everything, all the games, all the assignments. We didn't have no problems. Fitness-wise, it was all good. And, and they said to me, Hakan, you need to have your feet on the ground. You need to be realistic. Sometimes things you know, out of your control. You need, you need to be aware. Oh, okay. All right. So we had the game on the, the day before and that the next day I had to do recovery. So I was a little bit down thinking, well, maybe I will not go. So I did my recovery. I come back home and this is uh, in January, mid January, mid January in Australia is like 40, you know, 35, 40 degrees. And my wife and children were at the, they went out to the pool huh? because I work and I've got to do fitness and I've, you know, I need to sacrifice. And uh, my referee rang me up about to seven o'clock, 7 p.m. I said, well, why is Ben ringing me up for? Oh, I don't know. He must want something. So I answered the phone. 
And he says, to, and he says to me, Hakan, what are you doing in June, July? I said to him, nothing. What, what, what do you ask for? And he said, we're going to the Raw Cup. And I just froze. Froze. It was like, now it's in my hand. And I just started jumping up and down. And at that time, my daughter was coming in. They just come in from uh, the pools. They just uh, come into the house. They were outside. They come in and I'm, I'm jumping up and down, screaming, yeah, it's like this, it's just, and my daughter said, Papa, well, what's happening? Are you having a heart attack or something? What, 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 what's going on? And, I, and I'm jumping up and down saying, I made it, we made it, we made it, we made it. Like it was just a, a relief. And um, from that point onwards, it was all in my hands, If or the three of us, if we went to the World Cup. Before, this was out of our control. Now, for me to go to the World Cup, I had to pass the fitness test. I knew I had to pass the fitness test. Before, I had to be chosen. This was up to the committee, uh, the members, the chairman. They needed to decide who will go to the World Cup. So I think this is also very, very fond memory. And then all of a sudden, all the congratulations and all the messages that come. But but be aware also, remember, this is only the first part. Huh? Remember my friend who failed, got 6.81? He would have had that same aesthetic happiness as well but the job's not done huh you still need a lot of hard work and even when you pass the fitness test okay we passed the fitness test but we still have more to do what what is that we need to take care of ourselves because we don't want to come injured so we need to do massages we need to do all all of these are, are fond fond memories you know which uh you know those those two probably uh were, were etched in my mind and will always stay uh, with me for a very, very long time. Of course, so I'll ask you a final question and uh, before we wrap up, and I wanted to ask you, like, since you have achieved a lot in your career as a referee, and if you had to give a piece of advice to a young referee starting out, what advice would you give that referee? Uh, the one advice I always say is, uh, one, work hard. Work hard, work smart, believe in yourself, set yourself goals and don't let anyone, don't let uh, anyone say you can't. Okay, you can. Uh, what, why, why is it not possible to see a, uh, an Indian referee refereeing at the World Cup? Why is this not possible? Of course this is possible. Who would tell you 20 years ago that you would see a referee from Uzbekistan do three World Cups? People didn't know what Uzbekistan was. But there will be, and I say this, I, I spoke to one of my referee academy uh, referees just uh, last week. They were disappointed they didn't get nominated for FIFA this year. And I said, do you think refereeing is all about up, up, up? Sometimes we need to go down to go up. This is a good opportunity. Yeah? So it's all about attitude. For me, it's about attitude. Huh? You realise that that refereeing is not always going to be positive. You sometimes need to go down. You have a roadblock or you have a, a setback for you to go higher. You know, and uh, our setback, I will tell you this now, it was uh, 2011, we went to the Asian Cup. We didn't have a good tournament. Huh? And uh, we had one game and we were out. And, and this is the fact of life of refereeing. If you, have, if you have good game, good tournament, you continue. It's like a player. Player misses a goal, is not informed, he's out. He gets replaced, the substitute comes on. Same as with refereeing. Huh? So um, in 2011, we didn't have a good tournament. Huh? We, we, uh, we, we, we had some problems huh? um, specifically because uh, we weren't prepared. And uh, at the end of 2011, we were talking to the trio uh, with the other referees from, from our group. And we were saying, look, you know, FIFA are now preparing for uh, candidates and uh, you know based on the Asian Cup maybe we will, will not make it you know and I was really really disappointed really really disappointed and I'm thinking you know what uh, that's done because I know for me it was my, my one and only time to, to go to the World Cup and then what happened was um, um, AFC had the faith to, to put us on and this was a good thing you know why because when you, 
when you lose, when you think you lose something and you get given it, you appreciate it more. Whereas if, if everything is given to you all on a plate and you don't work for it, then you don't appreciate it. So we then realize, okay, guys, we had our, our decrease in the 2011. We need to go up now. So we took this one chance. We were serious about it and how professional we were. Even a lot of our colleagues were saying, you guys take this too serious. Yes, we are because we have a goal. So be prepared to go up, but also be prepared to go down. But the attitude determines what you do. I could have, I could have said enough. I've had enough. That's it. I give it up. But then I wouldn't have gone to the World Cup. And it's how you, it's how you react to that negative information that will determine your, your end outcome. Huh? I didn't give up. And, I, and the same thing I said to my referee, my uh, academy referee just recently, they weren't, they weren't nominated for FIFA. And I said, well, does it make you any less of a referee? No. I believe in their ability. I think they are fantastic. They are a really good referee. And I, I do believe that one day they will be a candidate for the World Cup. But I said, you need to pick yourself up. You need to, to train. You need to go. And you need to prove them that they are wrong. And this is what you need to do. If you believe in yourself and you put in the effort, you will make it. And don't let anyone say to you, you will not. You know, if someone said to me, 20 years before I went to the World Cup, that you will go to the World Cup, I, I would have said you're crazy. Really? But because I believed in myself, yes, I had the downs as well. You know, I was disappointed when I didn't get my FIFA badge in 2001. But what I did was I asked the powers that be, the director, what do I need to do? And they said, Hakan, you don't need to do anything. Your fitness, your performance on the park. Is... So I kept on going. I could have just said yeah, finish. I'll give refereeing away. This is the easy option. The harder option is to keep going and trying that. So for young referees, you need to put the effort in. Again, you get out of refereeing what you put in. Believe in yourself. Set yourself goals. But also don't let others say that you will not make it. Because if, 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 if I'd listened to people, you know, during my career... I would have given up a long time ago. Okay. Okay. Really, like on that note, I can thank you so much for talking to me and giving no me problem. so much of your time. You know, it's been more than an hour of your precious time, and I hope you can uh, produce more referees who go on to the World Cup as a dream. And uh, yes, maybe, and we can talk again soon. Thank you so much once again for coming. No Take care, no stay problem. safe. Bye. See you guys. See you. See you.